I'm so excited for our guest today, Joe White. Joe White's coming to us from Branson, Missouri, down by Canica Camps, where they have a family camp, camp for kids all over the country that is absolutely incredible every summer, sharing the love of Christ and discipleship. So Joe is the president of Canico Camps, the founder of Kids Across America and Cross International. He has authored over 20 books and has spoken at over 200 college campus events, numerous NFL football and Major League Baseball chapels. Uh, Joe has two honorary doctoral degrees in education and Christian ministry. He's been married for 47 years, has four children and 15 grandchildren. Joe, you're a busy guy. We're so happy you're here. And Dr. James Dobson says Joe White knows more about teenagers than anyone in North America. That is quite a statement. Welcome, Joe. Joe, when I was down in Kennecook uh, early this summer, I... I did um, had the opportunity to go with my family to family camp and you gave a talk on creation that we weren't expecting. We just heard, okay, Joe White's going to be down on the field and he's going to give this talk at night and it may be late. And I just said to myself, all right, I'm, I don't care how late it is. I'm going to go down there and listen to that talk because I had met you at Texas Motor Speedway. You had prayed over me. We had a, a really cool experience. I heard you share the gospel and I know I wanted to hear what God had to say through you in creation. So um, even the young children, like there was like seven year olds, eight year olds, they were captivated with the truth that you were speaking. And I'm just wondering, when did God lay on your heart, Joe, that you needed to speak about the truth about who created the heavens and the earth? Yeah, well, you know, I, I grew up in uh, South Texas, as I said on the previous podcast, and I was playing football in Dallas and uh, was taking uh, pre-med biology. And I, I love biology and genetics and all that, you know, the sciences. And, uh, and I was steeped in evolution. That's all that they taught at my university. And I, I know nothing different except evolutionary biology and, you know, Darwin's, uh, you know, ideas about uh, the origins of life, the origins of the cosmos. And of course, all the, all the magazines, Discovery Channel and anything you'd read that was quote unquote scientific was all about, you know, Darwin's philosophy of spontaneous generation, the Big Bang, et cetera. But then after I graduated, I started listening to debates on college campuses uh, uh, recordings of debates between Christian professors and atheist professors, Darwinists, humanists, if you will. And and I noticed that the humanists, the atheists, the Darwinists really didn't have any facts or data. All they did was ridicule the Christian profs uh, who actually had uh, incredible amounts of, of facts and, and data and evidence behind what they were talking about. And I felt cheated. I couldn't believe that. I'd never heard that in the biology classroom. And so I began to dig in deeper and to listen to more and more, uh, you know, debates, uh, Dawkins kind of debates uh, with, uh, with, with Christian professors. And the Christian professors, you know, made them look like the monkeys they thought we grew up, you know, once upon a time to a bit, you know, to evolve from. And it was fascinating. And so I just kept studying and studying, studying, and then I began to, to speak on the subject. And uh, it just became a lifelong hobby of mine. And so I began to write, you know, on, on a creation and speak, you know, more and more um, on it. And it's just, it, you know, for, 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 for the college campuses, it's great to be able to speak a different side of the, uh, of the equation and to have mm -hmm. the facts, the data, the evidence behind you. And then on the, in the high school campus as well, because high school kids way down deep, they really know there's a God, they just don't. It just can't fit him together with the science classroom. And so when you can put the, the brain of your faith together with the heart of your faith, it's amazing what happens. There's like an explosion mm -hmm. that goes off in, in, the, uh, in the mind of a, of a student or actually of an adult. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's been a lifelong passion of mine for 50 years now. Amazing. And, and Joe, do you know how long public schools have been teaching evolution in the classroom? Yeah, well, it's interesting. Darwin wrote his book in 1859, The Origin of the Species. And, you know, Darwin had a bad attitude about the Bible. He said the Bible should be no more, no more trusted than the writings of the barbarians. And he had a bad attitude about Jesus. He said that, you know, Jesus' doctrine of heaven and hell is a damnable doctrine. And so he came in there with a burr under his saddle 
And of course, he went to the Galapagos Islands in 1859, and he saw a bunch of finches with different sized beaks. And because these finches had adapted their beak size to the different kinds of foods they ate, he, he said, well, therefore, there's evolution. Well, finches becoming finches is not evolution. All that is is finches becoming finches. That's called adaptation. But he assumed that over the centuries, even though he couldn't find any evolutionary biology, all he could find was this idea that if finches become finches, the frogs could become lizards and lizards could become birds. And so he assumed evolutionary biology. But in fact, it never happened in science. And over the over the centuries, I mean, over the over the decades, science, because science was looking also for an atheistic bias. And so they just they just hitchhiked with Darwin's atheistic bias and built modern day science on Darwin's bias. But if we, you know, can get this talk into details, you know, it's easy to see that all it is is atheistic bias, that there really Mm -hmm. is no data. There really is no evidence behind the ideas that Darwin postulated back in 1859. And yet we're still teaching them in the textbooks and showing them on TV. And, you know, it's 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 really, really sad to treat students like students can't think. They ought to they ought to be able to give to students both sides of the thought and let them decide for themselves which is true and which is false. Right. I agree. And it, it seems like the enemy, that was just the way that he got in there to spread, you know, lies about who God really is and who created the heavens and the earth. And, and I feel like, I mean, me growing up, I just remember, you know, watching on PBS or learning in science class, how old the earth was and it's millions and millions of years old. And, you know, and you just, I just took it for granted. I just was like, this is what they're teaching. So it has to be true. And I wasn't a Christian growing up. And when I became a believer in Christ in my twenties and I started I mean, I just, my whole world turned upside down when I started reading some of these things. <laughs> and I, it took me a while to even, well, what is really true, right? Because this was so indoctrinated into my mind and my heart. And then you're reading the Bible and it's like, okay, how does, how does this work together? Because we know that now scientists are realizing that, um, that creation is divine. Some of them are proclaiming that. So how old Joe is the earth, do you think? Well, there, it depends on which dating method you look, look at. You know, there's some dating methods that show a very old universe and a very old Earth. There's also dating methods that show a very young universe and a very young Earth. And so, you know, it just depends on what study you're looking at. and also depends upon who you're listening to. But, but, mm-hmm. but the, the thing that, that old Earth people, and I, I respect, there's a lot of great Christians who believe the Earth's very, very old and the universe is very, very old. You know, the, the, the traditional thinking of science is the cosmos is about 13.7 billion years old and the Earth is about 3.5 billion years old. You know, Genesis 1, if you take it as historical, which I do, by the way, uh, teaches a seven 24 hour day period of time. Six days God created, one day he rested. There's a lot of Hebrew writing evidence. I could get into that, um, you know, another time. It talks about seven 20, six 24 hour days and one 24 hour day of rest. Uh, but, uh, you know, where old earth people, you know, sort of stub their toe, like I was in a debate with a very uh, well-published, uh, brilliant uh, friend of mine who is a solar physicist, and he's, you know, published all over the world, and he believes in a very old earth. And so we got into a little, a little friendly debate one time, and I said, Gary, I said, I said, do you believe God is omnipotent, which means God's all powerful? Well, he does believe in God. And he goes, well, you know, he said, I, I believe that. And I said, well, Gary, if God is omnipotent, could he have done it in six nanoseconds? I mean, if he's all powerful, could he have created stars with light immediately to earth? Like Psalms 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Could he have done mm-hmm. that? And, and, and could he have gone billions of light years immediately to the earth? Because that's one of the dating methods that makes the cosmos look very old is, you know, starlight traveling at the speed of light. It takes billions of years for some of it to get here. And mm-hmm. so how can we see it? But if God's omnipotent, it could have done it in six nanoseconds. And the great solar physicist said, well, I suppose if he's omnipotent, he could have done it any amount of time he wanted to. And he could have. If he's omnipotent, he could have antiqued, if you will, the universe. We can fast forward a DVD. We can fast forward an old VHS. 
we can fast forward a TV screen. Well, if we be people can fast forward some of our little moronic electronic tricks, couldn't God fast forward the universe? Well, of course. And then the WMAP satellite 206, we were sent on from NASA and took these pictures of the cosmos that have never been seen before. And they ran the pictures back in their computers down in NASA. And they realized an astounding thing that from the moment of inception, and they admitted this is published from the moment it started, they call it a big bang, which is ludicrous to believe that explosion started a cosmos, that nothing actually exploded and that nothing created over hundred billion galaxies in perfect order for life to exist on planet earth. You know, we all know that explosions don't create anything but disorder and chaos. Mm -hmm. But the Big Bang Theory thinks that, thinks, that, thinks that the Big Bang actually created a perfectly ordered cosmos, tuned perfectly for life on planet Earth. But at least they admitted, even though they still talk about a mindless explosion, the Big Bang, that from the moment of inception, now get this, if you don't believe that God's omnipotent, that the cosmos, the whole cosmos traveled over a billion light years in the first trillionth of a second. That's why Dr. Robert Jastrow, the founder of the Goddard Institute of NASA, declared, we know with absolute certainty that the cosmos was supernatural. And he went wow. on to say the astronomical evidence leads to a biblical view of the origin of the world. And so looking at it through the telescope of the I finest cosmology of today proves it was indeed supernatural. Now, if you want to put old age dating in place and look at it through an old age lens of naturalistic biology, as Darwin said, known chemical and physical laws, it looks very old. But if you believe that God is supernatural, that God can do anything he wants, that he's timeless, he can do what we think is a trillion years of work in a nanosecond if he wants to, or he can pack it into 24 hour days if he wants to establish a pattern for a biblical week, then he can do it in whatever amount of time he wants. But the Bible says that he did it in six 24 hour days. The Hebrew word is yom, Y-O-M. Mm -hmm. The word elam means millions of years, long days. The word yom rab means long periods of time. But the word yom, as it's used in Genesis 1, when it's used with a number, or the words morning and evening, it always means 24-hour day. The writer was clear to make it clear that cows produce cows, that horses mm -hmm. produce horses, that monkeys produce monkeys after their kind. And he did it in six yom. And on the seventh yom, he rested to set up the pattern for the biblical week. And then, as I said, there are many dating methods. I think there's over 60 that have been scientifically evaluated that show a very young earth. So it all depends on what lens you want to look through. If you want to look through the naturalistic lens, it can look mm -hmm. very old. If you want to look through a supernatural lens, it can look whatever age God wants it to look. Yeah. And God, it, it, we're spiritual beings, but I don't think we get in tune with that enough. And so I love what you're saying about uh, the natural and the spiritual, because God is so big and he is so now he's omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. He can do anything he wants. And God is God. And I think at the end of you know, your creations talk when you when you do discuss all of the facts, all of the science, um, all of the math at the end of the day, that's where we land is God is God. He is the king of kings and Lord of lords, and he is over all. And we are here for a purpose. But when someone comes to you and it says, you know, Joe, is evolution even possible because you you just said uh, something that I loved when I heard at camp explosions don't cause order they cause chaos and God is a God of order well Dr. Hugh Ross a great uh, Canadian uh, cosmologist and astrophysicist he and others that are as equally great in this field you know have studied the tuning of the cosmos 
And they have spoken and written that the cosmos is tuned to the trillion, trillion, trillion degree of perfection for life to exist on planet Earth. It's called the anthropic mm -hmm. principle. It's a, it's a principle accepted by modern day science that the whole cosmos is designed for life to exist on planet Earth. And, and, and Dr. Uh, Roger Penrose, another renowned uh, Cambridge astrophysicist said that the, that the odds of anything other than planet Earth being, being uh, a product of naturalistic Big Bang without God, you know, uh, uh, cosmology is one chance in 10 with 123 zeros after it. That's one chance without God. You, you know, so, so if you're an atheist or agnostic or a naturalist or a Darwinist, you've got one chance of being right. And those that believe that God created planet Earth with, with the life of man and woman on planet, planet Earth, as the Bible clearly describes, your chance of being right are 10 with 123 zeros after it. That's 10 trillion, 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 until I run out of breath. Mm -hmm. So it's it's scientifically, you know, even Webster's Dictionary, which is a secular piece, but in studying the science of the cosmos, Webster says that the cosmos is an orderly, harmonious system. What does it take to make order in a cosmos? What does it take to make harmony in cosmos? What does it take to make a systematic cosmos. Obviously, it takes a gigantic, massively intelligent, massively powerful designer. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I love your passion. Yeah, I mean, the site when you, I heard that at the creation talk, and you, you even had the kids get out uh, Legos and M and M's, and you were doing all of these. Uh, different examples of how statistically, even in a package of M&Ms, like how hard it is to get every color in a row. And it's like, I mean, it was like kind of simplistic, but then when you wrap your mind around it and how hard it would be for there to be an explosion and then all of a sudden here is planet earth. I was like, wow, this was, and my son last week was explaining it to his little buddies in the car. He was talking about the Legos and the statistics. And I'm like, man, you remembered everything Joe said. And I was impressed. So what you're teaching these little ones is really getting into their mind and heart. And you, you were talking about, um, um, transitions uh, in fossil records and things like that. And, and what, what is, what is that Joe? Could you explain that? Well, well, you know, evolution, the, the, the theory of evolution, uh, and, it, and, and, and don't let anybody tell you that, that, that there's science behind evolution. There is no science. It's an idea. It's a theory. Evolutionists say things like imagine, and they say, what if? And they said, if mm -hmm. you think about, or they call it imaginative manipulation. Uh, but, but, but creationists talk, talk about data. We talk about evidence. We talk about facts. We talk about studies. And but but the, but the but the mechanics of evolution are based on two things. One is positive mutations, and the other one is 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 the transitions or the links between species. For example, let's say the lizard evolved into the bird, or as the you know one of the most recent Scientific American magazine says, the hummingbird is the product of the evolution of a T. Rex dinosaur. And when you look at that, you you know you get really puzzled. You're like, okay, really? The T. Rex evolved into a hummingbird. Wait, did you? So you just said a dinosaur evolved into a hummingbird. That's what you said. Right, right. That's what it said. That's Inside crazy. American you know, okay. magazine. But but okay. but but anyway, all of the evolutionary trees, which are drawn in the textbooks, by the way, the only place to find an evolutionary tree where you have the amoeba evolving into the jellyfish the jellyfish into the trout and the bass the vertebrate fish they evolve into the frogs the frogs evolve into the reptiles the reptiles evolve into the furry creatures and the birds the furry creatures went on to evolve in different kind of furry creatures some horses some more into the monkey and into man eventually uh you know those are only found in the textbooks as one mm -hmm. brilliant scientist said you can imaginatively, imaginatively manipulate the evidence and you can make these incredible drawings. Well, that's what they are. They're incredible imaginative drawings. But if those drawings are true, then two things have to happen. 
let's say the lizard evolved into the bird. Let's say a lizard evolved mm -hmm. into a parakeet. Over millions of years, there were mutations, so to speak, in the DNA code, the little, the little, the little thinking helix that, that determines all the characteristics of life in an individual. And so there's certain codes in the DNA uh, molecule of a lizard that calls for scales on his skin. Mm -hmm. And the theory behind evolution is, is that there were mistakes in the DNA code, mutations. And the theory of Darwin was that the, that the mistakes were helpful, that the mutations were positive. And instead of thinking scale, they thought feather-like. And so there were millions and millions. In fact, mm -hmm. he said the number would be inconceivably great of these mistakes that, that all thought feathers instead of thinking scales. And so over the centuries, the scales became feather-like. And through billions of more positive mutations that thought feather-like, the feathers begin to elongate into more wing-like structures. And so over the centuries, you have this half lizard, half bird. And so he's sitting there kind of puffy, half lizard body, half bird body with half wings on his feet. And so there's a new scientific principle called the law of irreducible complexity, which says wings don't function unless they're fully wings. But even in your just, you know, uneducated mind, you can picture a lizard with half wings. Can he run? <laughs> no. Can he fly? No. no, he can't do anything except sit there and die. Hmm. And so, and so more, more recently, the last 30, 40 years, scientists have proven that mutations are actually pathological. Mutations are deadly. As one doctor, Dr. Barney Maddox says, the worst 4,000 diseases are caused from mutations. Mutations hmm. kill the species. He said there's only one positive mutation for every 10,000 bad mutations, negative, deadly mutations. And that's why Dr. Pierre Paul Grasset, the president of the French Academy of Science, said no matter how numerous they may be, mutations don't produce any sort of evolution. There's no law against daydreaming, he said, but science must not daydream. So mm -hmm. mutations don't help. They kill once and for all. You can't have mutations that transfer a species to another. And then the other test of evolution is transitions, links, intermediates. Links. In the fossil record, all Darwin could find was finches. Finches becoming finches. As I said before, that's not evolution. That's finches becoming finches. Different size species, mm -hmm. that's adaptation. Evolution is one species to a different species. But he thought in the future, the biologists, the paleontologists would find inconceivably great numbers of transitions. Darwin called them missing links. Hmm. Today, Dr. Stephen Jay Gould, one of the great evolutionists from Harvard, himself not certainly a professing biblical student at all, but he still calls them missing links. And in fact, Dr. Dr. Colin Patterson, the number one biologist in the world, certainly in all of England, he wrote a book recently called Evolution. He had no transitions. He had no links. There were no intermediates between anything and anything. All he could find was fossil lizards and fossils of birds and fossils of, of hamsters and fossils of E. coli bacteria and fossils of peppered moths, but no transitions. <laughs> and a Christian professor from California wrote him. He said, Dr. Patterson, why are there no transitions in your book, Evolution? And Dr. Patterson wrote him back. This is the, this is the chief paleontologist for the British Museum of Natural History we're talking about. And he said, if there was one transition, just one between anything and anything. He said, I would have included it, but there are none. So mutations are deadly and there's no links. That's why they call them missing links. And people are like, what uh, about the monkey men? Well, Piltdown yeah. man and the Australopithecine and, and Java man and Neanderthal man, not Neanderthal man, but uh, Nebraska man, they've all been proven as hoaxes. Piltdown man, they've all been proven as hoaxes. 
Neanderthal man has been now proven 100% human with a brain capacity just a little larger than ours. He buried the dead. He had religious ceremonies. Completely human. And so the, wow. the, 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 these, 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 these things, these elaborate structures they build in museums are simply made out of plaster, Paris, and fake hair. As one scientist says, there's very little integrity in the field of anthropology. Mm -hmm. That's the study of, mm -hmm. of, 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 of humanoids, mm -hmm. of transition between monkeys and men. And there's no integrity there. There's just all this theory. It's astounding to me that we have gone along with this for so long through this evolution theory. Yeah. It's yeah. wild. Yeah, and, and the problem is you've got to become a very secure, renowned scientist in your field to speak up. Yeah. As I've quoted some of these gentlemen, you know, so far in our broadcast, they are so secure in their field. They've already mm. been announced as the number one, you know, scientist in their field. So now they're they're not afraid to speak up because if you speak up about about the the uh, the fallacies in evolutionary biology, they won't publish you anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and like like Sir Fred Hoyle, who's been pronounced the number one cosmologist in all of England by the London Telegraph newspaper, he said the chance of life without God, the chance of Darwinistic evolutionary biology without God is one chance in 10 with a billion zeros after it, a billion. Hmm. There's only one in 10 to the 80th electrons in the whole cosmos. So that would be about as lucky, if you will, as flying through billions of trillions of cosmoses and finding a electron with a red check on it with a with a with a electron microscope in your first mm -hmm. try, I mean it's, wow. it's, it's it's impossible. But he's got to be renowned in his field before he'll publish ideas like that. Because if they don't, they'll just stop publishing you. Well, he doesn't care. He's already been declared the number one guy in his field, and he says without God, it is literally ludicrous. It's past impossible to think it could wow. all happen without God. I am so thankful that there's people out there that are speaking that truth. So, Joe, what? let's just go back to the dinosaurs. What happened to the dinosaurs? Well, you've got two basic schools of thought. Uh, the school of thought that's the most prevalent in, in modern-day Darwinistic older science is that about 60 to 100 million years ago, a gigantic comet struck the Yucatan Peninsula. And millions of clouds of dust erupted from, erupted from the strike. And the dust blacked out the sun, or at least most of the productive value of the sun. So there was no photosynthesis, so the plants died. And then the plant-eating dinosaurs died. And then over time, the carnivorous dinosaurs died because there was nothing to eat. And, and there's a couple of problems with that theory. One problem is logic. We all know, whether we're biologists or not, we all know the law of entropy, that things go from order to disorder. Things rot over time. Over time, things don't fossilize. Look at roadkill mm -hmm. alongside of the road. Those things don't fossilize. When animals kill over and die, they begin to decay because there's oxygen and oxygenation takes place. And the law of entropy or the second law of thermodynamics takes place. The only thing that can fossilize, as any paleontologist will tell you, is the instant coverage of mud, sand, and gravel in a flood. There must be instant coverage and an instant, uh, uh, an instant uh, uh, exit of, of oxygen, instantly. Mm. And so, and so, and so, you look around the world on seven continents. And you find dinosaur fossils on all seven continents. In fact, you find some T-Rex model dinosaurs fossilized completely intact. And if you think about it logically, as a dinosaur lays down and die and dust begins to gradually fall on him, he doesn't fossilize. He rots and decays and everything becomes dust over time. But if he's mm -hmm. covered instantly, instantly, by layers of mud, sand, and gravel in a flood, 
And in fact, the same Scientific American magazine I read that talked about the hummingbird evolving from the T-Rex also noted dinosaurs all over the world dying in a flood. And I've read five scientific period periodicals recently that all agreed on this statement. And it says this, that evidence continues to mount from all over the world that the demise of the dinosaur was the result of a flood wow. on all seven continents instantly covered by mud, sand, and gravel in a F-L-O-O-D flood. Duck. Flood. And so people are like, well, surely there wasn't a worldwide flood. I mean, that's just got to be a biblical story. Mm. Even though there were over a hundred ancient civilizations in the history that's been dug up by paleontologists talk about a worldwide flood. Not with a Bible in their hands, just because it was handed down from generation to generation. Mm. From all over the world, ancient civilizations, worldwide flood. And many of them talk about a surviving family. Many of them talk about a husband, a wife, three sons and their wives mm -hmm. all over the world. A Chinese tradition, which was handed down from a China, I mean, a, a Hawaiian tradition, which was handed down from an old Chinese tradition, calls the guy Nuhu and his wife and his three sons. And so even though there's data from all over the world of a worldwide flood, even though there's fossil evidence from all over the world of a worldwide flood, even though they're finally admitting the gigantic canyons around the world were caused by, by a massive flood, Science doesn't want to admit there's a Bible, and the Bible's accurate, and the Bible's scientific, and the Bible's real. Amen. We also are finding around the world in over 30 cave drawings, petrographs, hmm. where man who drifted off from society and woman have drawn pictures of dinosaurs. I've seen them. They're gorgeous pictures of dinosaurs carved in the rocks, maybe a few hundred, maybe a few thousand years ago. How do they know what they look like? If they, they didn't have like libraries, they didn't have photography. How could human beings a few hundred or maybe a thousand or two years ago at the longest draw pictures of dinosaurs on cave walls and the walls of canyons? And then in Glen Rose, Texas, they've actually found a fossil bed, a layer of strata with human footprints like a lot of them. One of them was size 19 <laughs> and dinosaur <laughs> footprints walking in the same strata. Wow. How could that wow. be? How come there's languages all over the world that talk about dragons and leviathans yeah. and behemoths and beasts? By the way, people say, well, the Bible probably is not scientific because it doesn't talk about dinosaurs. Well, nobody talked about dinosaurs till 1841. So Sir Richard Owen had been in the word dinosaur. Hmm. Everybody knew there were hmm. dinosaurs. They drew pictures of dinosaurs. They dug up dinosaur fossils. But they always called them beasts. They called them leviathans. They called them behemoths. They called them dragons. And there's languages all over the world about dragons, leviathans, and beasts, just like the Bible talks about. So apparently, if the Bible talks about beasts, leviathans, dragons, and behemoths in the lifespan of man, and if you see drawings of dinosaurs by man, and you see footprints of dinosaurs in man in the same strata, apparently they exist at the same time. Yeah. Apparently, Noah yeah. put small dinosaurs on his ark. You know, dinosaurs don't start off very big. He obviously did not put 80-foot T-Rexes. Those are very old reptiles. But obviously, there were dinosaurs on the ark, small ones, obviously. And coming out of the flood, the atmosphere changed. And thousands and thousands and thousands of species have since perished, including the dinosaurs. Okay. It's, okay. It's, 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 it's simple. When you look at it from the side of a scriptural context, it's simple to see. The Bible gives you the big picture of science and creation. Okay, I love that because I I don't know if I've ever heard it that way that there could have been um, smaller dinosaurs on the ark and that have just paired. Mm -hmm. You know, a di a, a dinosaurs are reptiles. Reptiles never stop growing. Mm -hmm. They grow until they mm -hmm. die. Lizards don't grow very much. Iguanas grow a little bit larger. You yeah. know, giant iguanas yeah. grow a little bit larger. Ancient dinosaurs grow a little bit larger and some of them to 80 feet tall. But you read the book of Job in chapter 40, it describes a dinosaur perfectly. It calls yeah. it a behemoth. That's what yeah. everybody called them in those days. It talks about this gigantic yeah. creature with gigantic muscles and gigantic bones and gigantic 
street that you can hardly believe. And it says, in Joe 40, it says he waves his tail like a cedar. Well, the cedars of Lebanon were like 80 feet tall. When they talked about cedar, they talked about the cedars of Lebanon. Mm -hmm. well, you call you, mm -hmm. some, some people were like, well, he's talking about a hippopotamus. Well, hippopotamus tails are about like that. It's like the flies, you know, <laughs> off their backside. It's something like elephants, you know, elephant tails. It says he waves his tail like a cedar. I mean, that is a perfect, the whole context is a, a perfect picture of a gigantic T-Rex or another wow. gigantic dinosaur wow. like you. Okay, that's awesome, Joe. I love that. Um, that's really helping, I think, our listeners sort out some of the things that they've heard about creation. And so why does it matter Joe, that we as Christians like truly understand creation, Genesis 1, um, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And I could go on and on, you know, let there be light. He created the day, he created the night, the darkness, but how, why is it so important that we and our faith understand the true meaning of creation? Well, either scripture is reliable or it's not. Mm -hmm. Either the Bible is God breathed or it's not. 2,300 times the scripture says, this is the word of God in so many words. Second Timothy uh, 3, 15 through 17 says all scriptures God breathed. It's literally God's breath. And in fact, I'll send you a, a bunch of books called The Faith Expedition that you could give away to your listeners Great. who want to study more deeply. How do you how do you know from science? How do you know from uh, li literary measurements of accuracy that the Bible is actually the God's word? And in any way you measure the Bible, the Bible is absolutely uh, God's word. But 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 if it's not scientifically plausible, then if it's not archaeological plausible. If it's not believable through the eyes of science throughout archaeology, how do you believe in the resurrection? Hmm. If the Bible's not God's word, how do you believe that Isaiah was truly prophesying about Jesus? And again, there's so many ways to measure the authenticity of Scripture. It's just it's thrilling to look at them all and go, this is absolutely God's word. But if Revelation 22 is God's word, then Genesis 1 has got to be God's word. By the way, Darwin believed that the cosmos was constant. He believed the cosmos always existed. But in 1920, Albert Einstein, who had read the Bible, he was a Jew Jewish fellow himself. He postulated in 1920 that the cosmos had a beginning, just like Genesis 1 says. Mm -hmm. So here's the Bible, 3,500 years old, so to speak. And, and the Bible says there was a beginning and there was a beginner. There was a design, there was a designer. And it took Einstein to come along and go, hey, I think the Bible's right. In the wow. 1926, Edwin Hubble saw the cosmos moving outwardly. And ever since Hubble, you know, theorized in his computer mind that the cosmos that was going outwardly had to have started. And now, as I said a minute ago, that the satellites have now proven the site that the cosmos had a beginning. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, had a beginner. And so the, the Bible, every time you run the Bible through the, through the, through the microscope or the telescope of science, you see the accuracy of the Bible. Isaiah said the earth was a circle. Everybody believed for the next 2,000 years that the earth was a flat square. But Isaiah said it's a sphere. Hmm. And the Isaiah, Isaiah also said, what, 700 years before Jesus? That's 2,700 years ago. Isaiah said he stretches out the heavens like a curtain, mm -hmm. which is now exactly the way the cosmos was created. It was created from God's voice. And it was stretched out supernaturally, like you would stretch out a tent curtain. Even though everyone else, the Romans and the Egyptians and the Greeks, they all thought the cosmos was constant. Mm -hmm. But the Bible just comes shining forth. The more we discover, the more we see how accurate the writers of the Bible are. That is thrilling. That is amazing. Joe, why did God create the heavens and the earth? What was his ultimate purpose? Well, you know, it, that's really a great question. And, and, and again, going back to science, it's called the anthropic principle. And the science of the anthropic principle, which is adopted in the hallways of modern day science, secular, Christian, biblical, whatever. It says that the cosmos was designed, whether they say it happened accidentally over 13.7 billion years, 
or whether they believe that God actually supernaturally put it together, the cosmos was designed for life on planet Earth. Hmm. The whole hmm. cosmos was put together so that man and woman could live on planet Earth. We're like the, the, the you know, the, the, uh, you know, the diamond on the crown of the cosmos. Hmm. And if you believe anything about biblical history, if you believe anything about the history of Jesus of Nazareth, you see the heart of the creator, if he made the whole cosmos for life to exist on planet Earth. And if you believe anything about the science of design, and if you believe in looking at the evidence and the facts and the data versus the theories of atheists, and then you put Jesus into the equation, then God obviously had a heart of incredible love. And as we have adopted in my family from Africa, children that are now in our family, and we love those kids who came in from orphanages as much or more than we love our biological kids, mm -hmm. that God as a father wanted to experience the heart of an adopting father knowing that giving man free will, we'd go astray. We would choose to go our own way. And then you put Jesus into the history of the earth and you see that God wanted to adopt. It's just so cool and so simple for the heart of a dad. He wanted to adopt. And it says in 2 Peter 3, 9, God's patient and he's slow to anger, not wanting any to perish, but for mm -hmm. all to come to repentance. God wants a big family. And that's why the Bible will soon be translated into over 7,000 languages. The, the Hobby Lobby people, the Green family, the, the Bible Museum folks, mm -hmm. they've got, you know, the different translators around the world combining their efforts now. And they're on track within 11 years to have the Bible in every known language of at least 10,000 people in the world. That's at least 24 chapters, mostly the book of John. In every language in the world, God is on a mission to save the world. Praise God. That's where you and I come in the picture. That's our job. Amen. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. So God created it for us. And, you know, I think it's hard for us as humans to wrap our head around, like, God created this whole earth. We, I was up north last weekend, and I'm just sitting out on the dock, and I'm looking up at the stars in the sky and, and the galaxies, and I'm just like, Lord, how how did you even do this? I mean, it's, if you really sit, like you said, laying on your back and looking up at this, at the sky day or night, it is a miracle. It is incredible. It is astounding. And yet when we sit and think about, he made it for us. Like if I sit and think about, he made it for me, it's really, really overwhelming, but it's also, um, it's, it's because he loved us so much that he wanted that relationship. And like you said, he wanted to adopt us and so what does that mean as someone where the God of the universe wants to adopt us? How do we, how do we do that? You know, how do, how do we just accept that adoption without having all these strings attached and feeling like we're not good enough, feeling like, you know, we're sinners or feeling just, you know, that how could he love me that much that he would do that for me? Well, as a parent, you get it. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, until you're a parent, or until you adopt a child, or until you're, you know, your your bride, your 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 homecoming queen, your hero, your wife brings home a child from the hospital, uh, it's really hard to conceptualize that. But as soon as you see a child come into the world, your overwhelming love for that child, or if you are fortunate to bring home a child from an orphanage in another country, and immediately your heart wraps around that child. And you love that child like that child is your very, you know, own gift from God. You get the love of a father. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. nothing like love of a mother or the love of a father. There's nothing like it. And the Bible is clear that God is father. That's why it's so much fun to witness to Mormon, I mean, Muslim guys, because they don't know God mm -hmm. is father. And when they understand that Jesus was sent to the earth to, yes, be crucified and, yes, become a sacrifice for our sins and that God wants to be father, wants to 
adopt us into his family of faith. Watching Muslim guys turn their hearts to Christ is one of the most wonderful things imaginable. Everybody wants to be adopted. Everybody wants to have a dad. And every little girl wants to know that she's daddy's little girl. And many of us don't have dads that live on this planet, or maybe our dads walked out, or maybe our dad was mean to mom, or maybe our dad didn't measure up to what we think a dad should have done. As men, we're fallen as dads. We're not perfect. But when we have a perfect father who loves us perfectly, it's like I saw a bunch of football players a minute ago out on this field where I am, and we were talking about playing for one audience. Mm. We call it audience mm. of one. Mm -hmm. Playing football mm -hmm. is if Christ is the only audience. And it gives these players in the NFL and colleges and high schools and junior high something greater to play for. And then they start playing for purpose because they're, they're, they're God who doesn't even see mistakes. Because that's the eyes that God sees us through, through the eyes of a cross. And it eclipses our mistakes, which is just an incredible thought. Mm. He has rose-colored mm. glasses, cross-colored glasses, and he sees us as adopted, as righteous. And so to, to everybody wants that kind of love and adoption. I talk in prisons, and mm -hmm. I talk to the NFL teams, and I talk to, you know, people on streets and, you know, Muslims and all kind of, you know, and everybody wants that. Everybody is hungry for that sort of a relationship with a father who's an unconditional lover. And so God says, behold, I say at the door and knock. Mm. If any mm. man hears my voice, I'll open the, and open the door. I'll come into him. John 1, 12 says to anyone who receives me, that's the spirit of Christ. To anyone, to anyone whosoever receives me, then I'll make him a child of God. And so it just takes letting down that last little wall, just putting, letting that last little hurdle lay down the track. You don't have to jump over it. You know, <laughs> that big sin hurdle, that big pornography addiction hurdle, that big sex addiction, that big, you know, uh, substance addiction or hatred addiction to your father because he wasn't there. It's just laying down that hurdle and taking Jesus by the hand and running the race together. Mm. That's Mm. That's grace. It's a gift. It's grace. It's beautiful. You're making me teary now, Joe. And not only that, it's that grace that he has for us in this earth now, but it's for eternity. And we get to experience that. He adopts us now, and that grace starts now in that new life, but then it goes into eternity, and there's a time when he's going to come back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and there's going to actually be a new heaven and a new earth was it is just so hard to understand, but it's going to be even more, it's going to be perfect because it's going to be without sin. And so, um, Joe, thank you for your explanation on creation. It was profound and beautiful and full of the Holy Spirit. And I'm wondering, um, before we go, would you be willing to pray for our listeners now, uh, just to bless them and, and, and if maybe some of them, you know, haven't crossed that hurdle, I love that I was a hurdler in high school. So I totally get like, let's lay down the hurdle and just let God take you. Um, but praying for them on what um, their needs are and where they're at with their relationship with Christ. Certainly. And as I said, I'll send you copies of the Faith Expedition and you can feature them online and your listeners can, uh, can pick those up from you. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Mm hmm Thank you so much, Father, for your incredible grace. Thanks for making yourself so clearly seen through the little birds that fly and the little monarch butterfly that migrates um, every year so so clearly, so brilliantly. Uh, the stars, the sky, the grass, the good ground, but mostly, Lord, through your son, Jesus, um, through knowing him personally and getting the privilege of being forgiven and walking in grace, um, just Thank you for a million, billion reasons, Lord. Thank you. Um, hmm. You just pray for somebody now, Lord, who needs a Savior, somebody who needs an adopting father. Uh, as you adopt them, Lord, as they receive you into their precious little broken hearts as Lord and Savior, just thank you, Jesus, for your promise to come into them and to fellowship with that person uh, for the rest of their eternity. In your precious name we pray. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joe. It's been an honor and a privilege to have you on Loved by the King. And for our listeners, if you want to get a hold of Joe, uh, you can go to canacook.com. You can also go to joewhiteparenting.com, joewhitespeaking.com. He's got a lot of resources and books out there uh, that you can Google. And man, you're just a powerhouse for the Lord, Joe. And I hope we can have you back again on Loved by the King. Appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Enjoyed it very much. Okay, God bless you and all of your ministries, and we'll see you soon. Good, thank you.